review the Juniper SRX SSL proxy with server name indication. First, we'll begin at the SRX CLI. We'll generate our key pair for our SRX 1500. We'll give the certificate a name and we'll give it the size and the type. Next, we'll look at where our certificate is stored under var db certificates and common. In this example, it's under the key pair folder. After creating our key pair, we'll create our self-signed certificate for use for SSL proxy. For our lab certificate, we'll create a subject with our Juniper lab, our common name of SRX 1500, our organizational unit for the TME lab, with the Juniper networks as the organization, our location will be Denver, our state will be Colorado, and the country will be the US. We'll give it an IP address, the domain name, last variable of the CA constraint so that it can sign other website certificates as the proxy. And our self-signed certificate is located under var db certs common and the local folder. The next step in configuring the SSL proxy feature is to load the certificate authority file that is located within the Juniper Network's Junos operating system. Here, we'll load the default values. Once our trusted certificate authorities are loaded, we'll enter our configuration mode. Once in our configuration mode, we'll load our trusted certificate authorities into the configuration first. We'll select all of our certificate authorities as trusted. We'll add our self-signed certificate as our root cert so that we can sign user requests. We'll configure our SSL proxy to ignore server authentication failures and log all of the information. Now that we've generated our self-signed certificate, loaded our trusted certificate authorities, and configured our SSL proxy profile, let's export the SRX 1500 self-signed certificate so it can be loaded into our browsers. As an alternative to the CLI, we can log into Security Director and configure our SSL proxy profile there. Let's review the profile we created in our CLI, and we'll add a few extra options. Under SSL Profiles, we'll pick our profile that we created in our CLI here and click Edit. We'll see we are going to add our preferred cipher as the strong option. We can see our root certificate of our SRX 1500 and we'll scroll down. We can choose here some exempted addresses if we choose to allow certain addresses to be exempted from SSL proxy. And we can also add our exempted URL categories for our server name indication. For this example, we'll select our financial category and our health category to ensure that we are compliant with all PCI and HIPAA requirements. We'll click OK and save our configuration changes to our SSL proxy profile. Our next step will be to move over to our firewall policies and edit our firewall policy. Here, we'll go into our SRX 1500 firewall policy and expand our policy rules from users to the untrust zone. Now, let's expand our advanced services for our SSL policy. We'll see here our SSL profile is configured under the policy. We can save that and then update our device. We'll see here we can review our configuration that's going to be added. It's going to be a simple whitelist for our server name indicator and our preferred ciphers. Once our device is updated from Security Director and receives the configuration updates, 
we'll move over to our CLI and check our statistics on the command line. We'll see there that our command line shows the statistics for SSL proxy are empty. From here, we'll move over to our client machine and generate some traffic. We'll log in as our IT user and launch our browser. Our home page is juniper.net. Let's review our SSL certificate that was presented. We see here that the SRX 1500 signed the website certificate. We'll move over to our financial institution website and see that it's signed by its normal public certificate authority. We can move back over and see our statistics have been updated. We can confirm here that our SSL proxy whitelist has been activated and that we have our URL category matches. Here we'll review the NGFW Application Firewall, or App Firewall for short. Let's begin by logging into Security Director. First, we'll review our NGFW dashboard. We'll see that our configuration for App Firewall is already running and has already inspected some traffic. We'll see on our dashboard that our applications are summarized by both volume and number of sessions. Next, let's select the Configure option on the left side banner. Once we load the Configuration section, we'll go to our Application Firewall Policy section. We'll select our signatures. Here, you can review signatures or create custom signatures. For our demonstration today, we'll use pre-selected signatures under our policy. We'll see our SRX App Firewall policy is here. Let's review it for details. We can expand this particular rule and see that we've selected YouTube and multimedia streaming signatures. We'll expand this particular rule and review the details. We've given our rule our name to block video streaming. We've selected our application signatures and we've selected the action for deny. We can see down below we've configured a custom message to indicate the SRX has blocked the video streaming application. Next, we'll move over to our firewall policy. We'll expand the SRX 1500 policy and review our rules from users to our untrust zone. We'll confirm that both our HTTP policy and our SSL policy are configured for application firewall. When we expand our advanced services, we see the SRX App Firewall policy has been selected under App Firewall. We can then confirm our SSL policy has the same. Now that we have confirmed our application firewall policy has the appropriate signatures, and we've confirmed that both of our HTTP and SSL policies have App Firewall enabled, we'll move over to our monitoring section in Security Director. First, we'll take a look at the various options available for application visibility. We'll see here our applications can be summarized in many different fashions. We can have bubble graphs, heat maps, and zoomable bubble graphs. We can also group by risk or by category. We could also change the time span if our investigation warrants that. We can also show based on bandwidth or on session. Now let's drill down a little bit deeper. We'll show the number of sessions with our heat map and we'll select one of our classifications to drill down a little bit further. Now that we have our sessions sorted in our heat map, let's look for the YouTube application. Once we find the YouTube application, we'll select all the users and see who was browsing before we applied our application firewall filtering. 
we see that user 1 from the juniper12.lab domain has been browsing quite a bit. Let's review Juniper Network's NGFW IDP functionality. We'll begin by logging into Juno Space Security Director 17.1. Once we log into Security Director, we'll first view the dashboard for our NGFW functionality and see the top events for IPS. Then we'll begin with our IDP signatures. Under our Administration banner, We'll select Signature Database. We'll see that our current database is 2984. Let's install database version 2984 on our SRX 1500 in our lab. Excellent. Now our database has been installed on the SRX 1500. Let's look back at our administration for Signature Database and confirm. Here we see it has been installed successfully. Next, we'll move over to our configuration banner on the left side and review our IPS policy for our SRX 1500. For our demonstration today, we'll review our simple IPS rule. It's a single rule that contains our enterprise recommended predefined attack group. In this rule, we're set up for no action based on inspection. That will allow all attacks to be identified, but not blocked or dropped. Next, let's move over to our user to untrust firewall policy and ensure that our HTTP and SSL policies have the advanced security setting for IPS set to on. Here, we can confirm both. Now that we've reviewed the configuration, let's go to the monitor section on the left side in the banner, select events and logs, and look at IPS visibility. First, we'll be greeted with the IPS attack summary page. We see here the IPS attack timeline. We can mouse over and see the various attacks at different times. We also see the widget for the IPS severities, and we can mouse over that and see how many we've received for each severity. We also see the top sources and destinations. A bit further down the page, we see the top attacks and the top destination countries. Now let's take a little bit of a deeper look. We'll select the detailed view page and see a list of all the current most recent attacks. We'll take a look at our very first entry and we'll scroll to the right. We can review all the various details of this particular attack. Each attack has a robust set of information available for the security analyst. From the source to the destination, the rule that was applied, the service that was monitored, and which attack was witnessed. Let's go through an overview of Juniper Network's NGFW UTM functionality for antivirus, enhanced web filtering, and content filtering. In with Juniper Network's Junospace Security Director, we see here our dashboard for NGFW functionality. We see our top blocked viruses, our top blocked websites for web filtering, and various other functionalities available on the dashboard widgets. First, we'll review our configuration for our enhanced web filtering functionality. 
we'll select UTM policies and select our web filtering policy section. Here, we see a previously configured SRX EWF profile. We can expand that and look at the various options, and then we'll go in to edit the policy. Now, let's edit the policy and see what available options there are. We see we have the Juniper Enhanced classification for web filtering, our denied action list for categories. We've already selected an extensive list and moved them to the right side. Returning to the main section, we also see we have several categories under Log and Permit. We have our fallback options that are all configured to Log and Permit for our lab environment. Now that we've reviewed our configuration for enhanced web filtering, let's add our web filtering profile to our UTM policy. We'll see here that we have configured the web filtering profile and the antivirus profile. Let's move over and review our antivirus profile. Now we can select our SRX AV profile and review the details. We see here the profile for antivirus is simplistic. The engine type is Sophos, and all of our fallback options are Log and Permit. Now that we've confirmed our web filtering and antivirus profiles are part of our UTM policy, let's apply the UTM policy to our outbound connections for users to the untrust zone. We'll select our HTTP policy and review our advanced services and confirm that our UTM policy is part of our advanced services for both HTTP and SSL below. After confirming our antivirus and web filtering profiles are configured properly, and our UTM policy is now bound to our HTTP and SSL policies for firewall, we can go to the monitor section in the ribbon on the left. First, we'll review our web filtering statistics. We see here in our summary view, we can see the top blocked URLs, matched profiles, top sources and destinations. We'll move over next to our antivirus monitoring. We'll select antivirus under the events and logs, and we'll see our timeline of all antivirus functionalities for top sources, destination, attack devices, top viruses, and the source countries. Now that we've reviewed the visibility for enhanced web filtering and antivirus, let's review our content filtering functionality that's part of our UTM policy. Here, we'll review the SRX CF profile, which is going to block EXE and zip files. We'll scroll down and select our exe and zip file content type and give it our file extensions for exe and zip. We'll now confirm that our content filtering profile is bound to our UTM policy. We'll scroll to the bottom of our UTM policy and see that for HTTP traffic, our content filtering is applied. Let's now move over to our visibility under monitoring We'll select Events and Logs, and we'll look at our summary page for content filtering. We see here that SSL proxy has been enabled for our top block protocols. We see now that we've blocked two zip files and an exe file, and we see that our source IP addresses down below represent the blocked sources.